Old Testament lesson comes from the book of Exodus, chapters 12, verses 1 through 13, and chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month will be the first month. It will be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole Israelite community, on the tenth day of this month, they must take a lamb for each household, a lamb per house. If a household is too small for a lamb, it should share one with a neighbor nearby. You should divide the lamb in proportion to the number of people who will be eating it. Your lamb should be a flawless year-old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You should keep close watch over it until the 14th day of this month. At twilight on that day, the whole assembled Israelite community should slaughter their lambs. They should take some of the blood and smear it on the two doorposts and on the beam over the door of the houses in which they are eating. That same night, they should eat the meat roasted over the fire. They should eat it along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Don't eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with its head, legs, and internal organs. Don't let any of it remain until morning and burn any of it left over in the morning. This is how you should eat it. You should be dressed with your sandals on your feet and your walking stick in your hand. You should eat the meal in a hurry it is the Passover of the Lord. I'll pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every oldest child in the land of Egypt, both humans and animals. I'll impose judgments on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be your sign on the houses where you live. Whenever I see the blood, I'll pass over you. No plague will destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, Dictate to me all your oldest children. Each first offspring from any Israelite womb belongs to me, whether human or animal. Moses said to the people, Remember this day, which is the day that you came out of Egypt, out of the place you were slaves, because the Lord acted with power to bring you out of there. No leavened bread may be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going to leave. The Lord will bring you to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. It is the land that the Lord promised your ancestors to give to you, a land full of milk and honey. You should perform this ritual in this month. You must eat unleavened bread for seven days. The seventh day is a festival to the Lord. Only unleavened bread should be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread and no yeast should be seen among you in your whole country. You should explain to your child on that day, it's because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. The word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. Lord, we ask that you send your spirit on us today as we hear your word. That as we read these old texts, they become new, ever new, for us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, a few years back, when I was serving in Utah, I got to be friends with the local rabbi, uh, Josh. And so Josh and I would get together and have coffee or have lunch every once in a while, and, and we'd talk about theology, and it was really fun to kind of get to know him and and uh, learn more about Judaism, and he learned more about Christianity, and, and uh, we decided it'd be a really fun thing to, to get our congregations together to do kind of a joint Bible study. And uh, we would stand together, and we'd pick a topic for the week, and uh, we'd let our congregations then ask us questions after we had a chance to kind of talk about that topic, each from our perspective, and, and then we would have this, this dialogue with the congregations. And it was marvelous. We decided to do it during Lent, uh, during the six weeks of Lent, which is also uh, getting close to the season of Passover for the Jews. And so both of our congregations gathered together. We met alternating from the church to the synagogue. And, um, and it was interesting because we had a lot of people go to 
uh, the synagogue on Saturday night from our church, and people from the synagogue would come to our church on Sunday morning to kind of see uh, what it was all about. So it was this marvelous time of understanding and getting to know one another. And one of the sessions we had, uh, someone asked the question of both of us. They said, sum up your faith, your religion, in one sentence. It's a daunting task. At least I thought it was a daunting task. Josh had no problem. He said, that's easy. Judaism could be summed up like this. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. <laughs> that was it. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. And I love the simplicity of that. But it describes so powerfully what happened. The story of the Jewish people, the story of God's chosen people, the family of Abraham that we read about in Genesis becomes a nation, and God takes them out of slavery, saves them. And then there is this Passover festival, one of many of the Jewish festivals, but probably the main Jewish festival year after year, where the celebration is not merely a head trip, it comes in the form of a meal. And that brings us to the text today, which is about the Passover. And it reads kind of like a liturgy, doesn't it? I mean, it's not exactly thrilling reading, but when you think about it, it's a perpetual kind of sacrifice. It's like reading a manual for worship. Here's what you're supposed to do to remember. But before we get to Passover, I need to catch you up on the story. Now, remember, last week we talked about Joseph. And Joseph was one of the sons of Jacob, who was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, you know, the, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Joseph, of course, gets crosswise with his brothers, gets sold into slavery, goes down to Egypt where he is a slave, but he rises up through the ranks and becomes a mighty official in Pharaoh's kingdom. In fact, he's in charge of all the granaries of Egypt. There was a great famine, and Jacob and the family had to come down from Canaan to buy grain. Joseph stands over his brothers now as dominant. They don't even realize he's still alive. And he forgives his brothers in that powerful moment. Genesis 50, 20. Remember, you meant this for evil, but God meant it for good to preserve a numerous people as he is now doing. At the end of Genesis, the family is moved to Egypt and there begins to thrive. And at the beginning of Exodus, we learn that they are actually thriving in the way that God intended people to thrive from the very beginning. Remember the command in Genesis 1 that these humans were to be fruitful and multiply? Well, Exodus tells us that God's people were exceedingly fruitful and multiplied exponentially to the point at which it became a problem for Egypt. Chapter 1, verse 8 of Exodus, there is an ominous sentence which says this, A Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph, who did not remember this history. And so this Pharaoh decides that he's going to enslave this people to keep them within his borders and use them as slave labor. And so they are set to making bricks and building cities. They build Pithom and Ramses, which are cities on the border of Egypt, cities where the grain is stored. The irony of that should catch anyone who reads it. Joseph was in charge of the granaries. Now his people are slaves building more granaries. But they keep multiplying. The more they are oppressed, the more they multiply. And so Pharaoh decides to engage in some population control. A genocide, actually where he decides to have all of the male children of the Israelites killed as soon as they are born. And so he orders the Hebrew midwives, two of them named Shifra and Pua, to kill the Hebrew babies as soon as they are born. As soon as they come out of the womb, kill them. Well, Shifra and Pua, who are Israelites themselves, say to themselves, we're not doing this. This isn't right. This is our people. And so they, they refuse to do it. And Pharaoh keeps seeing these Hebrew baby boys. And he says, 
to these midwives, I told you to kill the male children. And the midwives say to Pharaoh, you know, these Hebrew women are very vigorous. That's the word in the scripture. They're very vigorous. They have children so fast that we can't get there in time. And they have the children and they squirrel them away and we don't find them. And as a result of them tricking Pharaoh, God blesses Shifra and Pua with families of their own. It's one of the powerful texts in the scripture. Just a little piece that we gloss over. But without these two women, there might not be many more of a story to tell. Well, Pharaoh realizes the Hebrews aren't going to take care of their own children, so so he decides to tell all of the Egyptians, when you see a Hebrew baby, take that baby and throw it into the Nile River. He wants to make sure that these people stop growing, that he can keep the thumb of oppression on them. Well, then we read a story about a Hebrew mother who has a child, a baby boy and she keeps him hidden for about three months until she can't hide him anymore you know when they get to be about three months when they're tiny their cries are kind of cute but when they get to be three months or so then they get really loud you know so it's hard to hide them at that point point. and so she decides and takes a desperate measure of taking her son placing him in a basket lined with pitch Actually, the Hebrew word for that basket is the same word as ark. He places the child in the basket, and she sends him down the river, where he is found by an Egyptian princess, pulls him out of the water. This must be one of the Hebrews' children. Now, remember what Pharaoh had ordered. All the baby boys of the Hebrews are to be thrown into the river. But Pharaoh, even Pharaoh, who sees himself as a god, who is the ruler of all Egypt, can't say no to his daughter. she says I want to keep him and raise him and so she names him Moses which is an Egyptian name which means to be drawn out drawn out of the water his name is a foreshadowing of what Moses will do he will draw his people out of slavery in Egypt to freedom through the sea it's a powerful story and next week we're going to get more into the Moses story in particular But what we see here is that Moses is being called. He lives in Egypt, he grows up in Egypt, but then he is sent back after he is banished from the kingdom to come back as an old man and lead his people out of slavery. And he goes to Pharaoh, whom he knows. Pharaoh was probably Ramses II, that's what a lot of scholars think the Pharaoh of the Exodus. You can actually go to the Egypt Museum. I've been there in Cairo, and you can see the mummy of Ramses II. And he does not look like Yul Brynner, I can tell you. It was a bad day for him, apparently. But, uh, um, but the Pharaoh knows Moses. And Moses says to him, God has sent me here. Let my people go. But Pharaoh will not because it's so much better to have a free labor force within your kingdom. It's so much better to recognize that you are a God and that no other God can tell you what to do. And so he refuses. And that brings about what are known as the 10 plagues of Egypt. Now, when I was a kid, uh, I used to love when we talked about the plagues because I tried to imagine it, you know, this famine and pestilence and all this stuff across the land. I think when you're a young boy, you love to see things that are like biblical kinds of wrath of God kind of stuff. Dogs and cats living together, as Bill Murray says in Ghostbusters. You know, all that, all that stuff that's happening. Some of you got that reference. I, it's a little later. But, but you, you understand. This is real wrath of God type stuff. But when you read the text closely, one of the things you realize is that each one of these plagues is designed to attack one of the supposed gods of Egypt. For example, the people of Egypt worshipped the Nile River as a goddess because it provided for them all of this fertile land. God says, you want to worship the Nile? I'm going to turn it to blood. He demonstrates his power over Egypt's gods. Of course, when the water turns red, all the frogs come out. Now, the Egyptians had a frog-headed god. They believed in frogs were divine because 
they could live in two environments, in the water and on land. So God says to the Egyptians, you want frogs? I'll give you frogs. More frogs than you can imagine. Then there are insects. The Egyptians worship different kinds of insects. There is striking the people with boils, health. There was an Egyptian goddess of health, livestock. There are lots of Egyptian gods of livestock, and he strikes down the livestock. The ninth plague, he takes on one of the most powerful gods of Egypt, the god Ra, whom Ramses was named after. Ra, Moses, drawn out of Ra, connected to the sun god. But God blots out the sun, even, and makes it dark. The gods of Egypt are no gods at all when compared to the God of Israel. But even then, Pharaoh will not relent. Let my people go? No. That brings us to the tenth plague. God says, I will come through the land of Egypt, and I will kill every firstborn male be they human or animal. Remember that in the ancient world, the firstborn was to be dedicated to the deity. This was true in Judaism, but it was true in a lot of different cultures. In fact, some cultures took it to the extreme when they would take the child, the firstborn child, the firstborn male, and they would actually sacrifice him to the gods, kill the child as a way of making sacrifice to the gods. That wasn't the Hebrew way. For Pharaoh, his firstborn son, because Pharaoh was seen to be a god, he was a little god who was going to take Pharaoh's place one day. And God said, this is the plague. The firstborn will be taken. Now, when we read that as modern people, we think to ourselves, what is God doing here? I mean, God shouldn't act like this. This, There must be some mistake. And perhaps that's because we have domesticated God to the point at which we see him as an old man on a cloud who just dispenses wisdom. We're uncomfortable with the wrath of God. We say that's just an Old Testament thing. The, The God of the New Testament is much warmer and fuzzier. We'd rather hang out with him. Well, folks, same God. This God is a God of love, but also a God of judgment. Indeed, judgment and love are two sides of the same coin. See, God has a mission in his creation to make it new again. And God will not allow any anti-creation force to subvert his plan. Pharaoh is an anti-creation force, wants to wipe out certain people, wants to use his own gods, wants to make himself a god. God won't allow it. In fact, God is going to preserve his people at any cost. Remember Genesis 15, the story where Abraham cuts a covenant with God. Now, this is how you do it in the ancient world. Imagine if you had to do your mortgage this way. You make your mortgage like this. You take a bunch of animals and you cut them in half and you put the pieces on the side like an aisle. And then you say to the mortgage broker at the other end, may I become like these animals if I don't pay off my mortgage? That's essentially how you cut covenants and contracts in the ancient world. But here in Genesis 15, God cuts a covenant with Abraham. But Abraham, instead of walking through the bloody pieces because he's the subservient party, Abraham falls asleep and has a dream where he sees a pot and a torch go through the bloody pieces. And he understands what it means, that God himself is walking through the bloody pieces to ensure that his covenant will be kept. That God himself takes the blood upon himself to make it happen. And here we see God in the text getting his hands bloody and his boots muddy in order to bring about fullness of his creation and to preserve his people but as with God's judgment it's never arbitrary and God always offers a way out 
God says to the Israelites, take a lamb and take its blood, take its life and spread the blood on your doorposts. And when you do that, when the destroying angel comes, I will see the blood and you'll be passed over. You'll be saved. Blood, of course, in the ancient world as it is today, represents life. The life of creation is spread on behalf of God's own people to preserve them. The people who are to bring creation to its fullness, the people who are to tend it and care for it from the very beginning, now are saved by blood. The lamb given death in order to bring life. Of course, this plague convinces Pharaoh, finally. Convinces him that he's not a god. Although he will pursue the Israelites to the end, the blood is what saves them. The meal that they eat is not just for that one time. It's for them to remember what God had done over and over and over again, year after year after year, to be reminded that they have been set free from slavery. That even though you might be generations down the line from when this happened, you use the word we. We were slaves in Egypt. And God saved us. They were to eat the meal in haste. You notice the the barbecue? No time to drain the blood out of the animal, take out the internal organs, all the stuff you do at the butcher shop, but rather roast it whole, burn what's left. Eat unleavened bread because you don't even have time for the bread to rise. When the opportunity comes for you to be able to leave slavery and get to freedom, you take it as fast as it comes. So eat up and get ready to move because freedom and the promised land await. The youngest child at every meal, Passover meal, begins the meal by asking the question, why is this night different than every other night? Why is this meal special? Remember, we were slaves. Now we are free. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. A meal that has sustained a people through generations to the horror of the Holocaust people who have long been tried to be exterminated now live. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's eat. Then it was my turn to answer the question. How would you sum up Christianity in one sentence? I'm thinking about that the whole time Josh is talking. You know, there's a whole lot of ways to do that. But I thought the way he framed it was brilliant. And in fact, I think it frames Christianity perfectly. They killed him. He won. Let's eat. Jesus grew up in a Jewish family. He is one of Abraham's people. He is one of Moses' people. Born into a family where they would have celebrated the Passover year after year. Jesus was a firstborn to Mary, and so every time they read the text about the plague and the firstborn, Jesus would have understood what he had been saved from, what all had been saved from. Jesus would have tasted the bread and the lamb and the wine. He would have heard stories about his own childhood. Remember what Matthew tells us? That Jesus himself was saved from a genocidal king who wanted to kill off all the baby boys in Bethlehem. But he fled. Where? To Egypt, just like Moses. And he comes out of Egypt, and he begins to lead his people to liberation. Liberation in a way that 
the Exodus pointed to but did not fully comprehend. See, the Exodus story, the story of Passover, is a microcosm of the greater mission of God. They were being slave, saved from slavery in Egypt. Jesus was going to save his people. Indeed, offer all people freedom from slavery to sin and death. This Passover, a foretaste of a greater liberation to come. Jesus lives the story. It was a Passover meal that he ate with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And there they were gathered at the table as his people had done already for thousands of years. And the youngest disciple, probably embarrassingly so, would ask the question, why is this night different from all other nights? And they began to tell the story. We were slaves in Egypt, but God set us free. There were the elements on the table, the lamb roasted with unbroken bones, the unleavened bread, various cups of wine. And yet as they did the meal, Jesus took these symbols and he reinterpreted them in a way that caused the disciples to step back. This wasn't the way we normally talked about it. He took the unleavened bread and he broke it. And he blessed it. Blessed art thou, O Lord, who bringeth forth bread from the earth. Sign of manna. Sign of God's provision. And yet when he took it and broke it, he said, take and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. The firstborn son, as Paul says in Colossians 1, the firstborn over all creation was broken on behalf of his people, given, sacrificed for the life of the world. And then he took the cup, the cup of wine. And there are various cups of wine, the cup of blessing, the cup of suffering. We don't remember which one it was. It doesn't say. Probably all of them combined. And yet... He took the wine and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. New covenant. Poured out for you, for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Not blood marking doorposts, but blood to mark the hearts of his people as belonging to God. A sign of deliverance from sin and death, forgiveness offered to all who would take it. The blood and the bread, symbols of liberation and new life. The next day, he would go to the cross. The innocent child dying because of the sins of others. And yet three days later, his tomb will be empty, signifying that the power of death, that enslaving power that holds all of us in its grip, has been broken. He is free. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, what happened to Jesus is the prototype of what will happen to us. We will be set free from sin and death because of what he has done, his blood, his brokenness given for us. They killed him. He won. Let's eat. We still celebrate that meal, don't we? And we don't celebrate it once a year. We celebrate it every week. You know, today is World Communion Sunday, on the church calendar. This is the one Sunday a year where a lot of churches have communion. And we say, oh, isn't it great that we have it once a year? 
Why isn't every Sunday World Communion Sunday? If this means for us the liberation of our hearts and lives from slavery to sin and death, we should celebrate it as often as possible. That's why we do. It's the one thing we never voted on in this church. Do you know that? Because Jesus said, do this. John Wesley said we should do it as often as possible because we need to be reminded again and again that we have been set free from the law of sin and death. When we come to this table, we take the bread and we take the wine. We see the broken body of Jesus and we take his blood and we're reminded that we are marked as his people, that we are no longer slaves, that Egypt is no longer an option, but the promised land awaits, the promised land of his kingdom. And see, we need reminded often because Egypt has a powerful pull on us, doesn't it? That old life still looks good. The Israelites, I want you to imagine this, okay? So the Israelites see God's power. They see the angel of death do its work. They go with Moses out into the desert. They see the waters of the sea parted before them dry ground they walk over on the sea crashes in on the egyptians then god provides for them in the desert manna and quail where there ain't no food he leads them by a pillar of cloud in the day pillar of fire by night sets up a tabernacle lives among them and still at that moment they say you know egypt wasn't that bad Back there, we didn't eat manna every day. I'm tired of quail stew, quail kebabs, quail McNuggets. Back there, we had meat, we had vegetables, we had stuff. Yes, we were slaves, but, but remember Egypt? And God says... Remember what I did. You're not slaves anymore. Egypt is not an option. There is no plan B. There is only the promised land. That is your hope and your life. So we come to this table And we're reminded again and again when we eat of it that we've been set free. And we need reminded often because this world really wants us to be back in Egypt. And we come here and we hear the words Christ given for us by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. We say those words in the liturgy. Christ has died. Christ is, come on, risen. Christ will. They killed him. He won. Let's eat. That, my friends, is the gospel. That is the way to freedom. Now, I don't know what Egypt is pulling you back to, whether it's an addiction or some other kind of brokenness, some besetting sin you might have that you can't shake, the temptation to go back to an old way of life. You come to this table in a little bit, and you'll be reminded, as Paul said to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 1, for freedom Christ has set us free. Do not put on the yoke of slavery ever again. You are free. They killed him. He won. Let's eat. Amen. Lord, as we gather at this table... We become part of this story. We pray, God, that you would remind us 
as we take the bread and cup, the lengths to which you have gone to save us. We thank you for the lamb, for his blood, for the broken body, for new life. You delivered us from slavery. Lord, help us to live as free people, free to be all that you created us to be. In the name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.